So as mentioned, I'm Chris Power. Thank you very much for having me. Um, this is my first time in Bremen. It's been very, very nice. I've had a good couple of days exploring the city. Um, so I am an associate professor at the University of York, and I had the pleasure of joining Able Gamers a couple of years ago. And at that time, we set out to try to do some new games user research and try to pull out information that will help the game industry. One of the really interesting things is that when you look across accessibility in games, a lot of the work is done from a ground up point of view, which is absolutely fine. But there comes a time where we need to do systematic study of these things and start building out knowledge of what's working and what's not working, and also maybe ask some of the hard questions that are out there regarding why people play and why we all play together. So a lot of my background is in inclusion. I started in the web where I gained a bit of a reputation as being a troublemaker. I used to ask questions like, why do we keep using these guidelines and why do we keep doing it this way? Because it's not exactly how we do design otherwise. But I moved on into games and found that I started asking the same questions. And one of the things that frustrated me was that we kept talking about games in the same way that we talked about other interactive technologies. And when we talked about interactive technologies, we often talk in terms of, well, how do we do a thing? How do we get someone to the point that they're able to do a thing, whatever that thing might be? And it might be that we're trying to stream movies on an app. It might be that we're trying to deliver some information through a PowerPoint presentation like this. Or it might be that we're trying to do the fun thing of pay our taxes. But one of the nice things is that when I go to pay my taxes online, I have a success criteria. And that success criteria is I have paid my taxes or I have not paid my taxes. And that's what's driven a lot of our accessibility. It comes from our physical accessibility as well. When we look at getting on the stage to give a presentation, we have a ramp over here which says, okay, someone with a physical disability can come up and they'll be able to do the thing of giving a presentation. Success criteria met. And that's fine when you have that success criteria. And indeed, that drove a lot of our success in accessibility in digital from the 1960s forward. When we look at blind programmers during the 1960s, they were able to program because we had punch cards that they were able to work with. When we brought in the original screens, all of a sudden exclusion was reintroduced. And all of a sudden, they couldn't do the thing. And we ended up with an implementation lag of always trying to catch up. But one of the problems is that when we go to games or any real media that we're trying to consume, these are art and culture. They don't really have the idea of a success criteria of I did the thing. If I can move a character around in a game, such as, let's say, Mass Effect Andromeda, if I can move that character, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm playing the game. It simply means I can move the character around. The fact that I can actually move from point A to point B isn't actually playing the game. There isn't a task as we normally think about it. Because if that were true, and we were able to do these sorts of things, then I would just give my kids something like Kerbal Space Program and say, go do the thing and learn about space. But they don't do that. Because games are about something else. Games are about having an experience. And one of the things that frustrated me for a long time in working with games is I didn't see why we were still asking the same questions. We were still asking questions about where the barriers were. Now, those are important questions. Don't get me wrong. And a lot of my work is around trying to solve those barriers. But it seems to be framing the problem wrong. Because we stop at the person can move the thing. And we need to start changing that discussion to talk about experience. Because when I play games, I'm not looking to just move something. I'm looking to be able to drive a really fast car around my medieval town that I live in in York because they won't let me do that otherwise and for really good reasons. <laughs> it's one of the things that I want to be able to do. I want to experience that thrill of going really fast for no apparent reason without any consequences. Or it's something like Mass Effect, which is one of my favorite games. Mass Effect 2, I got to go and fight the Reapers. I got to go with a ragtag band of aliens and other things that allowed me to actually go and explore space, fight the bad guys, and even fall in love. And that's a remarkable thing that paying your taxes doesn't deliver. <laughs> well, not for me. It's about being able to play in multiplayer. So something like Dragon Age Inquisition, where I can go with my wife and fight a dragon. Now, I, I typically pay a mage, and so I'm the guy standing in the fire here. And she's probably up front, not dying. And it's one of those things that we can enjoy together.
or connect with people beyond. I play a lot of games with my friends back in Canada. You may have recognized that my accent is not exactly British. But the games allow me to connect with my friends, which prior to digital gaming was difficult. But for me, I'm a big comic book nerd. It's one of the things that defines me, is that I adore superheroes. And Stan Lee died this week, which made me very sad. But one of the great things was he gave me something like this before he went. I get to be Spider-Man. I get to explore the world that I grew up reading. I get to fight the bad guys, but I also get to swing around and see landmarks that don't exist in real life. Or if it's the case that I maybe don't get to travel very much for whatever reason, which many of players with disabilities don't get that opportunity, I can see New York in a fully 3D rendered way. I can stand on top of the Empire State Building, which is something that none of us can do, and get an experience that otherwise we wouldn't have. And so I argue that games are about experience. And that's not a new thing in our field because we know that there's a lot of work out there looking at player experience. But in accessibility, we often leave this aside. And it's not because we don't have a desire to deliver these experiences, I don't think, as either educators or as game designers. I think we know and we want people to have those experiences, but we're always having to play catch up. We deliver things and then have to have an implementation lag where we try to fix them. Whoops, we put that barrier in, we have to go and try to fix it. And we spend a lot of our time playing catch up like that. And so what I'm trying to do with this talk is I wanna give you some idea about the types of options that players with disabilities use based on some research that we've been doing. But more importantly, I wanna communicate to you what the experiences are that players with disabilities have. Because you as media educators are going to push that out to a next generation of game designers. And my argument is we need to stop thinking about accessibility as a separate thing. We need to start thinking that we're delivering experiences to our players and we're delivering them in ways that are different only in terms of the types of options that they choose to play with. It's still a personalized lived experience that that individual will choose and tune for themselves. Now, I talk about accessible player experiences. For me, an accessible player experience is about the player having the experience they want to have, free from barriers related to their disability. And that's what I try to target in my design talks and in the designers, with the designers that I work with. Now, I don't do this alone. I'm very lucky to have a great team that I work with. So at the University of York, I work with Paul Cairns and Jen Beeston. Now, Paul is an expert in player experience. He's one of the guys that really, really turned me on to the fact that we need to think differently. Because if we get trapped only thinking about basically the feedback loop and getting information in and out of the game, there's actually a very difficult way to do gener generative design. It's very hard to generate new ideas if all you're thinking about is that loop as opposed to how do we tune the challenges to people. Jen Beeston's a PhD student with us. She helped create the Able Gamers player panels, which is where a lot of this data was driven from. I'll talk about that in a moment. And she's working primarily to understand the social experiences of players in games. And she's part of our Iggy program at the University of York. Mark Barlet is the founder of Able Gamers and our executive director. He provides us a lot of context into the field and understanding of what the game uh, developers are looking for and we have two members in the organization who've been helping us collect the data that I'm going to talk about today. Greg Haynes is our games user research and research associate. Um, he's been working with us for the last year doing a lot of this research and Craig Kaufman who's our community manager who in particular helped us collect the data at the Penny Arcade Expo that I'll be talking about a little bit later. So as I mentioned, a lot of our data comes from the Able Gamers player panels. Now, player panels was something we set up approximately a year ago. It was intended to provide a matchmaking service between players with disabilities in the game industry. So if you have a game studio who wants to test or do user research with players with disability, they had no avenue to recruit those people except from a grassroots effort. So we've tried to provide that contact point and we do this matchmaking free of charge. One of the things that we thought we would get was maybe around 30, maybe 50 people. In the first day, we had 120 people sign up. 
Currently, the active membership sits at over 400 people. We have full demographics around, for around 350 of them, and we've had 15 projects come from various companies and organizations, unfortunately, most of which I can't tell you about or I think I would be shot by a sniper from the game industry. But those panels, we're very fortunate to have a very, very large representation. We have a lot of people with physical disabilities, both upper and lower limb. We have people with mental health difficulties sitting around the population average of around 20 to 25 percent. We have people with learning disabilities and people with a variety of different sensory disabilities. And I'm also very pleased that we have 10 percent of people who are neurodiverse. We have a relatively small proportion of people who are either blind or people who are deaf, and we have a low proportion of color vision deficiency. Now, that's interesting because color vision deficiency and colorblind options in games are often seen as the low-hanging fruit. Now, we actually have very few people in that, but that's largely, we think, because people with color vision deficiency often don't identify as having a disability and probably don't engage with us quite as much. But I think it's an important aspect for reasons that I'll talk about in a moment. And working with these players, we've collected a large amount of data about the options that people want to use. Now, interestingly, we have a lot of this information in the field, but it's never been systematically correct collected, and we don't really have an idea of what the proportion of use is. And we also often work from the point of view of, this group will use this, where we have, for example, my color vision deficiency people will use recoloring. In reality, most of the people that I talk about in player panels have multiple disabilities, and that's very, very common. And I think pigeonholing people into a single group does a disservice, first of all, to us as researchers and educators, but also does a disservice to the players, because each individual is a rich tapestry of their lived experiences and the complete person that they are. And so to try to pigeonhole them and say, well, you must be a person with physical disabilities, is not helpful in a lot of cases. And I'm going to try to tell you why that is. Because there's a lot of myths that I run into when I go out to talk to game designers, talk to media educators, and talk to students. And those myths I find myself repeating over and over again. And when I hear myths, the thing that I want to do is I want to collect data and dispel them. Because I think there's nothing more powerful than data. Myth one is that players with disabilities only play self-paced games. Things like card games or Myst or something where they have control over the environment. That they don't play sort of the, the high twitch games. When we look across the player panels, there are hundreds of AAA commercial titles that they play. And they do not fall into the category of single player self-paced games very often. There are certainly those who play turn-based games. There's people who play almost every type of game I can think of. When we look at the ones that repeat commonly in the set, the top three were Destiny 2, World of Warcraft, and Overwatch, all of which were sitting around 15% of the group of people. Now, that's quite a lot of players who are playing major games that are multiplayer games and are playing with other people. And that's the first really important aspect of this, because it's not that people are isolated in single-player games, but instead, we're all playing together. And when we ask people where they play and who they play with, we found that people were playing all over the place. They were playing local multiplayer. We see a lot of players playing local multiplayer, and a lot of them play with friends and family. So how many people in the room have played Rock Band or Guitar Hero? No one. Wrong audience to ask that question to. Everyone, it's okay, it's okay, it's 20 after 10, I get that, that's okay. So probably there's a few more people who have played one of these music games. But probably very few of you own them. Because gaming is social even when we're in our living rooms, right? And when we move online, we find that those friends and family carry over. But we also see a large proportion of people playing with online friends or with strangers people that they meet online and have the opportunity to engage with with whom they otherwise wouldn't. And we also see some players do one-on-one, -on -one, where those are fighting games or multiplayer battle arenas where they can jump in, play, and get out. And we see a slightly higher proportion of friends and strangers there. So we have players playing AAA titles, and we have them playing multiplayer, be it either at home or online. Myth two, accessibility options are used by a narrow group of people. 
Now, this is that pigeonholing of players. Well, you're a person with X, and therefore you should use Y. That doesn't make sense to me as a designer, and it doesn't make sense to me as a player. I have lots of options that are not related to a disability that I can figure in a game. Why does it matter that some happen to be more prevalently used by a particular group of people with disabilities? And indeed, when we start looking at different types of options, we found that 32% of our players used assistive technology. There's often a theory that, oh, well, you're disabled, you must have a special technology that you use. Actually, it was only about two-thirds of people, and those were predominantly people with physical disabilities or people who are blind. Everyone else uses software of different kinds, but only 70%, approximately 67%, use software options that one might consider an accessibility option. So they're using other things to engage with play. Now, some of that might just be repositioning controllers. It might be changing aspects of the game that otherwise aren't considered accessibility, but it's still personalization of the game so they can play. And when we look at, I'll just, I have a number of options I could go over, but I've chosen three. One is key remapping. Now, this one sits about where we would expect it. It fits primarily with people with upper limb disabilities where they're doing remapping. But about 10% of people that we find don't have a physical disability who are doing that key remapping. This is where you take a button on one part of a controller and say, use this part of the controller instead. The big one that surprises me the most is subtitling. Now, there's always been a myth that subtitling is used by a large proportion of the population. Turns out, it's true. That's pretty exciting. That's a fine myth to have. But when you look at my data back regarding my players with disability, only 14% of people had a hearing disability or were sign language using deaf people. So I have 40% of my, sorry, almost 50% of my players using subtitling who have no disability per se that drives that. But it's still an option that's being used by a larger number of players. So this is an option that we should be putting in. Why do we classify it as an accessibility option? It will give access to people with hearing disabilities where they otherwise wouldn't have it. And in that way, it's really, really important. But beyond that, we have lots of players who can benefit from it. And similarly, with recoloring options, I mentioned my color vision deficient people. I called that out as a small number because 20% of players are using recoloring options. And I have a cute story that a couple of weeks ago I was in Paris. It's probably three weeks ago now. I'm not sure. What, what country am I in? I'm not really sure right now. In Paris, there was someone who jumped up for a talk later on and said, I can answer your question as to why they're using color, the recoloring options. It's because in Fortnite, if you use recoloring, you can win because it highlights the enemies differently and it makes it more clear. And this was really interesting because it's a repurposing of an option that originally was intended for people with disabilities but people are using it to tweak and give themselves a competitive advantage, which is an interesting experience aspect that we weren't aware of. Myth three is that players, don't play very, players with disabilities don't play very much. Fine. My daughter plays Child of Light, and she plays it a lot. So what does not very much mean? Well, we asked people really specifically, first of all, how they identify themselves. And one was, that we had 150 of our respondents out of 230 that make up this portion of the data say that they were gamers. And they had that identity of being a gamer and that's a really important thing because gamers are a distinct culture in themselves. But it's interesting also that, you know, about 100 people don't identify as gamers and actually specifically indicated they didn't consider themselves a gamer. But 138 people did say it was their primary hobby. We have 101 who are hardcore, however they define hardcore gamer, and 68 who consider themselves more casual gamers. So people have identities that they tie into this. But when I look at it, and I go into the data, 90% of my players, their typical play session is between two and four hours. That's quite a lot of gaming. So even if they're casual gamers, they're still gaming quite a lot. So what do we have? Well, I think to use the quote from a 1990s television show, I think that we've busted the myths. And we have a large number of players who are playing AAA titles, and they're playing together with the non-disabled peers online, often friends and family, but not always. Often it's friendships that have been forged within the game. And there's a variety of different options that they use. 
and they're passionate gamers who are seeking experience. And that's such a nice thing to see because it means in many ways they're like everyone else. They want to play games and they see it as an important part of their lives. But how important? When I went into the literature, almost all of the work that we have is sitting at the level of what I call access, of trying to get around the player feedback loop. How do I put information into the game and how do I take information out? Now that's actually not too surprising because we spend a lot of our time in accessibility trying to solve those problems. And until we get a, a different design rhetoric happening in our design teams, that's going to still happen that we have to play that catch up. But when you look over the last 10 years, the rest of the research field has moved on. We're looking at experiences. That's what we talk about. So what are the experiences that players with disabilities want to have? Well, we went and we talked to people. This is what I tend to do. If I don't know something, I go and ask players. And I'm very lucky that 120 of my player panels people participated in this. And they did an online survey for us where we asked an open question, which was, why is gaming important to you? Now, when I worked in the web, I didn't get data anywhere near this number usually because people aren't very interested in the web. And I'd usually get one or two words, oh, it's fine, or it's da da da. I'd get something in my open answers, but not very much. I, I got tons of data from these people in that they wrote me stories. They told me stories about specific times gaming was important to them or why it is meaningful to them. And I love working with gamers so much sometimes because people are so passionate about these things. And my gamers in player panels, they provided me with so many great stories that I'll share with you in a little bit. But we also wanted to compare with people with no known disability to us. And we went out to the broader community at the Penny Arcade Expo and we asked 71 people this same question. And my players at Play Penny Arcade Expo, they did the same thing for us. They told us wonderful stories because they're passionate gamers there as well. Now we did a thematic analysis on this work. Now if you're not familiar with the thematic analysis, it involves immersing yourself in the data early on and getting a feel for what the words are that people are using. And then we did an analysis of the player panel data first because we felt that we wanted to ground our analysis in those experiences that players with disabilities were having and then compare it to the broader group. We then took the coding, the labels that came out of that of what we thought the story was and analyzed the PACS data the same way. We did some reliability checking for those who are interested. It was sitting at around 90%. And then we did some thematic groupings and pulled the codes together into broad themes. And I want to share with you what those themes were. Now, the interesting thing is many of these themes are shared with our mainstream uh, gamers um, who have no known disability. So a lot of it is about that idea of connection. Now I showed you already a slide saying that people were connecting and we have some validation around that because this came through as a strong through line in both the player panels community and PAX where people are using games to socialize. They're using it to connect with their friends and have fun while overcoming different challenges. That's one aspect of it. But we also heard this idea of a community, that the community and culture around gaming is really important. That showed up a lot in PAX, and that's not surprising because it's a gaming expo primarily. But they talked also about the broader communities that they formed. And we heard those same words being used among our players with disabilities and player panels. So this validates some of that powerful story. But when we dig deeper into the data, we start finding people talking about diversion. They talk about using games to divert themselves from everyday real life. Now I do this too. I find I read something on The Guardian and I immediately have to go play a game so I can forget about what's happening in the world. Probably some of you feel the same way. But for our players, it's the same thing. A lot of them, like my player panels member here who talks about it helping them wind down after a hard day at work. Or when someone's feeling anxious or nervous, they can use games to try to um, ease and get some stress relief. And this idea of de-stressing in the colloquial sense recurred again and again, with one player talking about how it helped them prevent adulting for a little while, which I thought was a lovely sort of statement. But tied into that diversion was the idea of escape. And escapism also came in a couple of different flavors. 
some of it was about being able to jump in and experience a fantasy world. So being able to jump in and explore either a fantasy world or space, like I was talking about with Mass Effect Andromeda, and the type of world building that's going out there, and a chance to see and experience things that otherwise you couldn't. But then there's also from our player panels this notion of escaping the everyday around them. And this lovely quote, from one of our players that talks about allowing travel to a different world that's extra nice when it's hard to go out in real life and it relieves the sameness of the chair all day. These are very powerful stories and this idea of being able to escape not only sort of our real world around us but also potentially experience something we otherwise couldn't, that's a big part of gaming and it's certainly something when I talk to designers that they're passionate about providing. One of the smaller themes, but an interesting one that came through that will probably speak to you as media educators, is that a big part of this is about games as art. It's a shared culture, and we had people talking about comparing it to either literature or film or art in museums, where it's something that we can share together. And for individuals who necessarily don't go to museums a lot, this was a very powerful way to share art. And there's also a notion of creativity being able to not only create yourself in many cases, be it forging a new identity or actually creating a game, or creating content related to a game in something like Twitch, where we have a lot of players with dis disabilities streaming now, but also experiencing the creativity of others and being able to see that in the artifacts that we're playing with. There was a notion of games being beneficial and this benefit comes in a couple of different ways. One is more of a concrete beneficial, where people are learning new skills or gaining competencies they didn't have before, such as one of our player panels members who talked about studying Japanese, and, or sorry, studying English as a child through games, and then studying Japanese because of games, inspiring them to learn something new. While others are less tangible than that, it's things around helping people problem solve or practice skills that they necessarily don't get to practice in everyday life. And one of the really interesting things about the benefit side was when we started hearing some of this stuff from players in packs, a couple began to identify as people with disabilities. Now we didn't screen people beforehand, we wanted a broad population. We didn't expect people to start talking about their disability, but because of it was people from Able Gamers doing those interviews, it kind of naturally came up. And a lot of people talked about the benefit of games in helping them manage aspects of their disability. In particular, we had a couple of people who talked very passionate about their um, generalized anxiety disorder or depression and how games gave them a structure. It gave them a way to engage with the world that they otherwise didn't have. And simply knowing that they could go online and have those interactions was really important to them being able to manage and carry on in their lives. And these are very powerful stories about what games bring. The last theme is the really important one. So when we looked at the data very closely, there was one theme that was predominantly present in our players with disabilities from player panels. And that was the idea of being enabled. That games enabled them in a way that very few other things allowed them to do. They were enabled to play at the same level in this notion of leveling the playing field between them and their non-disabled peers and giving them the opportunity to participate on equal footing. We saw this in the PAX panels with a couple of those people who identified as having disability as well. However, largely our PAX panel didn't talk about this. Gaming, we often think of gaming, and there's a lot of rhetoric in, in education and in game design around, uh, sorry, in game research around, well, games are about challenge and it's about people having competency and autonomy. And yeah, that might be true. I'm not saying they aren't true, but it's not the primary reasons that gaming is important to players. It's these other things that I've talked about. And maybe you do get some competencies and things like that, and the benefit theme hints at that. But for our players with disabilities, it is absolutely the case that that competence and that autonomy and that ability to have control over your situation and a structured way of interacting with the world provides enablement in ways that very few other things can. And as a result, playing together is a really important facet of their lives. And things that we heard in the stories was about gaming being part of their life, right? 
And we heard that from a lot of players, but the idea of a way of life is extremely important. So in summary, players with disabilities, they want experiences in games. And they want experiences that lead them to feeling primarily enabled through play. That's the really powerful thing. Players in games with disabilities are enabled players. They're people who are competing and playing on a level playing field. And I feel that that's because they're getting the experience they set out to have. They set out and if they can get to the game past whatever barriers might be presented and they can get that experience, they feel enabled by that. And I prefer this idea of enabled over empowering because I think it links back to, again, those, those competencies back to autonomy and a lot of the key motivators that we talk about in games. It's important that those experiences have them connect with others, that they feel benefit from the time that they play, that they're diverted from everyday concerns and they're enriched by a shared culture, which is something that I think if we start shifting to talking about people sharing experiences as opposed to let's make this game accessible to someone, all of a sudden it opens up a very different conversation in design rooms. It's we want to provide ways for people to access these experiences. What does that look like? Because then it's not just about the feedback loop, it's also about tuning the challenge in the game. It's about finding ways to open up those experiences to players that otherwise they might not have. And we heard almost everyone say, gaming is fun, which you might expect, but fun is really hard to measure. But the thing that I really liked is that people talked about, it's a way of life, it's universal, our players talked about, in, in particular in PAX, which I thought was a really sweet word that we could use. But you might be thinking, well, that's really great, how do I get there? That's really hard. And you're right, it is. There's a lot of catch-up that has to happen, and when we have games that we're retrofitting, it's hard work. Because we have to get around that player loop, and we maybe also start have to, having to think about how do we change the challenge in our games. And by changing the challenge, I don't mean making the game easy. I mean providing ways for players to tune the challenge to match their abilities so they can have the experience they want to have, and that accessible player experience I was talking about. So, what I'd like to do is point you at a website that we've created. It was launched two weeks ago. It's called accessible.games. If you go there, you're going to find, first of all, links to our player panels that I talked about. So if you have game studios that you work with who are starting to think about pushing out into working with players with disabilities, they can contact us through that. Um, but also there is a set of design patterns that we've created. We've been building on the data that we've been collecting for the last two years and thinking about how can we start influencing generative design. A lot of our work right now is around evaluative aspects of design, so checklists that you go through and say, here are the things that you have to do. Checklists, I argue, are okay for testing, but they're really hard to design with. And anyone who's done any accessible design in any technology knows that it's very hard to generate new ideas when you're staring at a list. So what we've done instead is we've provided a set of design patterns that encapsulate some of the options that we see from the data that we've collected and link it back to the types of players that it helps, a broad range of different players. But more importantly, it provides a set of examples from the industry that you can look at to inspire yourself and your designs. And you'll see that when we talk about a lot of these things, the way you approach it is distinct to every game. And it's not meant to be a checklist, and it's not meant to be something to go through, but instead you can picture it sitting in your design room with these patterns open and saying, right, where might we have barriers that look something like this? And those happen either at the level of the player loop with access or trying to tune that challenge. So if you have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out. And thank you very much for listening to my talk. You were a very attentive audience.